In the spring of 2008, Gaston County was a community on edge. In early April, 22-year-old Jamie Fraley vanished after getting a ride to a local hospital for a bad case of the flu. They've put out flyers, billboards, done everything possible to find her. Less than four weeks later, another woman, Jennifer Ramsey Rivkin, would disappear as well. Jennifer Rivkin, a 43-year-old whose car was found abandoned in Gastonia in 2008. Her car found just miles away from where Jamie Fraley went missing. While police have never found evidence that these two cases were connected, the pain each of their families feel is a tragic bond that binds them together. Join us as we shed light on the unsolved cases of the past. This is Gaston Unsolved. Jennifer Ramsey Rivkin, a mother, singer and songwriter, and hairstylist, grew up in Bessemer City. Her parents, Hilda and Clayton Ramsey, raised three children, Jennifer, her younger sister Janet, and brother Jeff. The family often took weekend trips to Lake Norman. Janet and Jennifer enjoyed swimming, water skiing, listening to music, and just laying out under the summer sun. Of course, you know, I, I always looked up to my sister. She's my big sister, you know. But I was always proud of her no matter what she did. I mean, she, she could draw, um, she could paint. Um, she just had this gift with her hands. Um, so of course, you know, even young, watching her do things like that, of course, you know, I, I looked up to her. Jennifer graduated from Bessemer City High School in 1983. She married her first husband and in 1987 gave birth to her son. Marcus. We both were pregnant at the same time. Our children are only five months apart. So um, when Marcus was born, which is my sister's son, um, she had a hard time getting him to take naps. I would go over to her house and lay Marcus on my stomach. I was pregnant with Natalie. And uh, it would help Marcus take his naps and uh, give her some relief as well. Um, but, uh, and it's kind of funny how that goes because Natalie and Marcus are very close to each other, um, like brother and sister. From a young age, Jennifer had a passion for music and for hairstyling. Her mother was a beautician and Jennifer followed in her mother's footsteps, attending barber school in Charlotte to kickstart her beauty career. She started in Bessemer City. Um, eventually the people that were in the exact same location sold it um, to Jennifer, and that's where Jennifer and company came in, and um, she had many, many years of uh, being a barber stylist um, there. Um, actually, what took her to Nashville was to continue to do hair. Jennifer met her second husband in Nashville where she moved to continue her hairstyling business while writing songs, as well as managing an artist there. She lived a life of luxury for some time, as her husband, David, was a successful music producer and engineer. Known as David Z, Jennifer's husband worked closely with artists like Prince and Etta James. The life of money and fame had a dark side as well. She traveled to Nashville and uh, of course, I mean, she just, she took off from there and she did great things there, did great things here at home. And um, limelight um, is a struggle. Um, and I, I believe that my sister had um, an addictive personality and that kind of made it harder um, for her to say no um, when it come to the parties. And you get caught up with the people in that kind of life that industry um, where you want to fit in with them. You know, once you start, um, it's, you know, really hard to not 
be in that limelight of that party scene. Um, and I think that it, I think it took its toll on Jennifer. Eventually, Jennifer and David would divorce, and she returned home to Gaston County in 2004. Her lifestyle of addiction, however, was not so easily broken. According to Janet, Jennifer kept her family life separate from the people she would hang around. We did everything we could for, um, despite it. Um, you know, Dad continued to help Jennifer pay her bills um, because she struggled to pay bills once things got um, so far out of hand in, in Nashville. Um, and then he finally convinced her to move home. Um, we tried two or three times to get Jennifer help. But you know, you have to want help in order to get help. Most of the people that she hung out with, we didn't have a clue who they were. She just, she didn't talk about them. Jimmy Arndt is a cold case detective at the Gastonia Police Department, which has handled Jennifer's case since she went missing in May 2008. She may have got involved in things she probably shouldn't, but uh, that happens to a lot of people, whether it's, you know, a, a lot of people sometimes have medical issues and their medical issues get them hooked on something and, and uh, lead a person down a lifestyle that they wouldn't normally lead. Uh, but she was still out there trying to do the best she can. Uh, there were some people that were trying to help her at the time uh, do a uh, do a tough time, and uh, and sometimes life is a struggle, and, and people struggle, and so she was struggling. Janet Les saw her sister on Thursday, May 1st, 2008, when she visited the family's business, Carolina's Electric Motor Service in Dallas, which has closed in recent years. The sisters talked for hours, and Jennifer even spoke of returning to Nashville. The last known evidence of Jennifer being alive is a voicemail she left for her friend on Sunday, May 4th. Two days later, a silver BMW Jennifer was driving was discovered in the parking lot of a local bar in Dixie Village called the Winter Circle. The sunroof was completely open. Her purse and driver's license found left inside. From there, the trail went cold. Fifteen years later, Jennifer Ramsey Rivkin is nowhere to be found, and no one has been charged with her disappearance. Rita Conley worked for the Gastonia Police Department from 1983 until she retired in 2002. For the last 12 years she was at Gastonia PD, she worked as a forensic detective, collecting blood samples, fingerprints, and other evidence. After her retirement, Rita took an interest in cold cases, specifically Jennifer Rivkin's, as well as Jamie Fraley's. So when, once I retired and I realized that the cases were cold and weren't going anywhere else, I thought maybe I could help them. I just think that if I could do something that I should, anybody that could help should help. And I'm just, I just want to help them. I just want to help them find closure. And I hope that that'll be soon. Rita befriended Jennifer's family and offered her expertise to them to help locate Jennifer, chasing down any tips that could lead the family to her. Rita says the family is looking for places where Jennifer's body may have been dumped, as well as any leads on where she might be living we have been out searching, physically searching, in fields and bridges and everywhere that we even think um, that we may find Jennifer's body. Because like I said, you have to look for a body and then you have to look for the person also. So I'm always looking, <laughs> always looking. But somebody had told us that the car that picked her up that night in the parking lot went out into the right down Myrtle School Road. So we've been down Myrtle School Road, at the bridges, in the woods, and just any lead we get, we'll, we'll go look. Family and friends have done all they can to keep Jennifer's case alive. They held a candlelight vigil for many years following her disappearance, including in the summer of 2018, a decade after she was last seen. I always thought she would come back at first. I really did, despite it, but, you know, days turned into 
weeks and weeks turn into months. I still have hope, but you know, that's just me. I'm her sister, you know. I I'd love for her to be here again, you know. She's, you know, it'd be nice to have a, another shoulder to, to kind of lean on now that, you know, mom and dad are gone, so. You learn to deal and cope with things, and you learn to, to, to realize, you know, you don't stop thinking about that person, but life has to go on. You have a family that you have to take care of. You have children you have to take care of, so um, you have a job. We've, we've interviewed a lot of people, a lot of her friends, a lot of different people. And this is one of those where somebody knows in particular knows, and uh, are afraid to uh, give the information for fear of retaliation. The, the family has suffered through the years. The mom passed away uh, not knowing. Uh, the dad recently passed away not knowing. Uh, her uh, sister I've been in contact frequently with over the years. Uh, her son has uh, recently moved, moved back to the area. We're, we're really searching for closure for the family. I think regardless, people are still afraid. Um, I think when you deal with addiction, that most people, regardless if they knew her or not, if they grew up with her or not, even if they know something, they're never gonna, they're not going to say anything. Um, and maybe that's their way of saying they just want to stay out of it. Um, and, and or you could be someone she used to hang out with at some of these places. Well, if I say something, then. One, am I going to get in trouble? Two, am I going to be harmed? Or three, I may lose my supply. I mean, it's, I think when you deal with something like this, a lot of people just like to leave it under the rug and maybe it'll just eventually go away. Um, it doesn't help the family because we don't have closure. Um, I have nowhere to go to visit my sister. I hope for my sake and her son's sake that, you know, we finally, you know, find out what happened to Jennifer and, you know, where we can have that closure and um, we can have that place to go see her and, and will it happen? I don't know. I would still like to see the case solved. I, I would still like to be able to find Jennifer and give her the what she deserves, you know. Despite being an addict, she was still a person, a human being, um, a mother, a sister, and a daughter, and an aunt, and a friend. And she had a lot of friends, a lot of people that still miss and love her. Next time on Gaston Unsolved, a case that crosses county lines. A much-loved sister, daughter, and mother who met with a violent end. It's been over 35 years, but the question remains the same. Who killed Robin Lynn Moore?